All right, good afternoon, everybody. Steve McDonald, the Sheets Title Company. Uh, with me, Lizzie Griffin. Uh, Lizzie Tesseroff's here with us, and probably most of you have probably worked with her at one time or another. Um, they were talking about uh, red flags on a title report. Um, kind of brush up, uh, not doing any like super, super deep dives into stuff. Um, not anything that would take like a full hour of a class to explain, um, but just things that come up and uh, Houseworks usually a little better when it's interactive, so raise your hand, ask questions. Um, you don't have to wait till the end or anything uh, crazy like that. Um, so, uh, with that, one other thing that I would like to say um, before we get in on the prelims and things like that is, you know, we get a lot of times where people come to the signing, the closing, we hand them the prelim, and the clients look at it and they go. Oh yeah, I got that in the mail. They don't have a clue what it is. They probably barely look at it. And I always like to remind people that you know we are not paid by the hour. You know that is our product, and you know we would like to be considered you know a part of your title and escrow team. So as your you know, buyers, sellers, you know get questions where you know you guys can answer some of them, but you know this is what we do you know all the time. Feel free to pick up the phone, call. We'll sit in the conference room with them. Like we want them to feel comfortable about what they're getting and paying for. We don't want them feeling, oh, geez, we're paying the sheets title a couple thousand bucks, and oh, I don't know why, and blah blah blah. So we're not attorneys. It doesn't cost any more to have your clients feel comfortable and get a good explanation on it. So keep that in mind if we're going through kind of some of the the red flags and things like that. You know, sometimes it's best to just. Come in, have a conversation, and it's not going to affect their, you know, fees that they're going to pay in any way, shape, or form. So with that, I will turn it over to Lizzie and go ahead. Hello, welcome. Thanks for coming to the class. Uh, so today's class is red flags on title reports, and I was mentioning to John and Dan, my goal and wish for you is that you never see a title report like this because we put a lot of bad things or a lot of things. Um, to raise questions on this and hopefully you don't have any of them, but you might have one or two. And so here's just some things to think about, um, take a look at, ask your um, escrow officer if you run into any of these things. But first we're gonna start off with the title report itself. Now there's four title companies in town. We're all showing the same thing, but there's in a little bit different format. But our job here is to give you everything of public record on the doc, everything of recorded public record on this particular property. So we're gonna have the property address here. You're gonna have your escrow officer and your title officer here. Most of the time, you're gonna call your escrow officer if you have a question on your title report. Our title people take calls all the time and answer questions. I like to know if you have a question on the title report, so I like to be involved in that process. Um, then we go down and we have the amount for the owner's policy. Now this is normally a fee for the premium, that the seller pays for. That is boilerplate in our um, contract, in your contract, I should say. So one thing to make sure, make sure we have the right sales price. Sometimes with counter offers, back and forth, um, it might be, we might have a question on, sometimes they're not signed, so we're not sure which, which one is valid. So just double check us uh, with the amount of the sales price. The next amount is the loan amount, and your lender shows here. Also underneath this owner's standard policy is your buyer's name. So if you represent the buyer, make sure we have the buyer's name spelled correctly, or maybe Janet and James are coming into title with their um, son or daughter. So we should have another name added here. Just something to be aware of. Um, and then we go down here and we have our seller, Joanne Smart, who acquired title as Joanne Doe. What that means is she, originally was entitled as Joanne Doe, and there is a deed or is there something recorded telling us that her name has changed, but she is one and the same person. Uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about, the seller, this should actually match the contract. And a lot of times, maybe not a lot of times, that might be excessive, several times we see where this doesn't match. Maybe the contract has an LLC and it's still is in the people's personal names, or it might be in a trust and the contract just has their personal names. 
something like this, I would suggest always getting a list kit before you go to that listing agreement or listing um, meeting so that you know exactly how your sellers are entitled. It's a quick fix. It's an addendum. Uh, sellers on this transaction are, you know, so-and-so to match our title report, unless, of course, they do want to change title before closing, and that's something that we can discuss. Yes? So on an LLC, I can't remember, can an LLC purchase property, or does it have to be someone's name in the transfer? So an LLC can purchase the property. Now, if they're getting a loan, there might be different requirements for that, depending on what type of lending they have. Um, if it's a commercial property, we see people purchase LLCs all the time, and they prefer it like that. And then they can also sell on an LLC as well. So, okay. Um, the only time uh, that this vesting here wouldn't match is if your seller came into not vested title, but bought the property on a contract of sale. So you would still have the original owner here, then there would be a memorandum of contract on the second page. I just wanted to disclose that to you that there's a few times when this seller isn't going to be on your contract. But for the most part, it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Going to the second page now. Perfect. Second page. These are our general exceptions. These um, A through E are the items that are going to stay on the owner's policy to the buyer. They get removed with the lender's policy to the lender because there's an additional premium for that. So we'll kind of skip those, but we see the first thing that you'll no normally see are the real property taxes. So exception one, if there are any back taxes, this would show here. Uh, but these people are current, which is great. We like seeing that. Or during that time when the taxes, it's a new tax year and the taxes haven't turned, so that's from July 1st to about October 15th, you're going to see not yet due and payable. And that's when we prorate a little bit differently, um, or I like to say backwards on the closing statement. Jump in on back sure. Real quick. Um, another thing that we've seen, and it doesn't come up all the time, but if you've done net sheets with your clients and okay, I think you're going to get about a hundred thousand dollars out of this property, things like that. Probably one of the most more common ways where that number starts to get off is they don't usually tell you that they haven't made their taxes in three or four years. So suddenly that hundred thousand is now eighty thousand. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. If you see back taxes and you told them that they're going to get a hundred grand out of the property. You might make sure that they told you that they haven't made their taxes. In. So. It's a good point Steve brings up. And that's another thing where a listing packet um, will help you because it will show any back taxes on that. So that's, yes? Um, if there were back taxes, is that something that escrow can pay through the proceeds of the sale? Absolutely. Yep, we take that off of, we take that right off of the, the only time that we wouldn't is if it's getting close to a foreclosure, a tax foreclosure. And I believe that's, Three to five years? Is it five years with this? It's supposed to be five years, but we've seen the county be pretty liberal. Okay, that. so that would be the only time that I would suggest somebody pay that before closing. Uh, you notice here, I put this little exclusive farm use potential tax liability. Um, sometimes you'll see put, a potential farm use. This one actually did have a tax liability. Um, this property must have done some rezoning, maybe a minor partition, something like, you know, just something to add to the title report. So this amount for farm use deferral or farm tax liability, either one, one thing as an escrow officer we have to make sure of, is that buyer going to keep the property in farm deferral? Yes or no? If they are, we'll have them sign something saying that we intend to keep it in farm deferral. And then if they don't, they realize that there is a tax liability to take that out. The second thing is this amount can be negotiated between the buyer and seller. Normally, you would think that would be a seller's fee because the sellers had those deferred, but sometimes the sellers don't want to pay those. And depending on what you've negotiated with the property, 
that can be negotiated between the buyer and seller. That's something that we want to know. And that's something that as escrow, we will reach out to you to find out. But if you see that on the title report, you might, hey, what's this? You might want to know more about this. We can get something from the county. Um, the county's really good about us calling them and, and having a printout of what is due for that uh, farm deferral. Same with the forest deferral. Yes, John. Is that something that, is there something that triggers you need to call the assessor to make sure so if they can't get the property on deferral? We will show, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Well, uh, I was just going to say, when we um, do the title report and we run the taxes, the taxes will disclose right on there, like their property is in yeah. so, And then the same with it was the veterans It'll basically tell us if there's any kind of. Because I see that on dial when you, when you go on there, it'll say mm -hmm. when they have like a red flag on there just for yep. additional tax liability. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's exactly where we do. Okay, so there isn't something special that triggers you to go specifically look for that. That same thing that you're seeing is the same thing that we're seeing there. And that's how it's going to be So that notation on dial, then that's kind of like you better double check. It's that. Yes. Yeah. And that happens every so often where, oh, it's flagged as something you need to make more than okay. But yes, we do a deeper dive into it and make sure that there's nothing um, unusual. There's no other tax Any more questions about that? Okay. So that's one quick thing. Go ahead. This question came up this morning is um, like with, with EFU, the farm use thing. That's a deferral, um, so that's not a, they go away forever, whereas the veteran's exemption is. So you see veteran's exemption, they're exempt. Farm use is deferred, and you know, and those can carry years and years and years, and, and they can build too. So like this person, if they kept the 17,000 and just kept it rolling, and let's say, in their time of owning it, it builds twenty more thousand. You know, when they go to sell it, it's going to be thirty-seven thousand um, is owed. Um, and you know, as you're representing your clients too, you know, I, I probably know this, but like this was kind of a seller response. Those were the seller's taxes when they owned it, and so it could be if it's going to continue as farm use. Listen, I'm assuming seventeen thousand of your um, Property taxes, let's take 17000 off the price, or however, that's how you guys do it. But um, that tax action only comes to available on moving the farm to or doing the purchase? Correct. Or changing zoning or something something to that effect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Good point. And then the senior um, exemption, is that just like the senior? Uh, senior um, is actually a deferral. So yeah. we. It is. So we have to get a payoff from the state, um, state of Oregon. Those run through the state of Oregon versus the county. So there's a senior tax deferral, um, and it is a deferral. There might be something where, where it's um, an exemption, depending on the senior, but what I've seen are the senior tax deferrals. The state pays it on behalf of the um, seller when they're senior citizen, but then when they go to sell, we have to get a payoff. And there would be a notation here underneath the taxes for that. I don't know. I'm thinking 65? That's a really good question. Sir, can you write that down? I'd like to know that, actually. We'll get Jeff on that. What do you say that the senior deferral, I know that there's reduced property taxes for mm -hmm. it, and then, you know, if I sell my property to you, I've got a senior deferral, you're not a senior, the state then no, they've been they've been paying they've been paying. So when you sell your property to me, the escrow officer would get would call for a payoff from the um, Oregon Department of Revenue and then put that on your closing statement. Oh yes, we do pay that back to the state. Mm -hmm. Yep. Question? Very interesting. Okay. I mean, who knows about this? I mean, it doesn't sound common. I've never heard of that before. 
Um, I think there's some agencies in, uh, that are advocates for senior citizens that own property that probably do that and suggest that. No, there are taxes owed. There, are taxes there if if she's under farm, if she's under senior citizen deferral, yes, the seller, and that can even happen on an estate. So the little old lady goes to heaven; those senior citizen deferral taxes will stay on the property. Yes, that's so they can stay in the home. Their their cash flow, they're still owed. Yes. No free lunch. No, no. <laughs> Not that I've been aware of. So the title transfers to the next generation, if you get daughter, son. Mm -hmm. The same thing happen or tax? So um, it depends if it's insured or not. So let's just say you're. Are you talking about a deed that mom deeds yeah. to the? Okay, mom deeds to the daughter outside of escrow. That exception for senior citizen deferral will remain on the property. We would show it on a title report when that daughter goes to sell. I'm not sure what exactly the protocol is with the state since the person who's a senior citizen is no longer there. I don't know if they check web query um, or check uh, deed status on all of their senior citizen deferral properties. Um, it might be one of those things that becomes due and payable. That's a good question. I don't know if the local you know, county dial would alert the state that hey, there's been an ownership change. I don't know if that happened. It it, it it might be, you know, until they sell. I mean, that's really what the state is banking on is that once they're doing this and then once the property sells, that's when they're getting paid. So it goes from a like from a senior that's on a deferral to into a living trust. And then and I've had this happen recently. If we've got time, I mean, because this is, but so it goes into a living trust, that person dies, right? And, but one of their children is living in the house. Okay. So that trust continues to go on because the trust specifies the child. The successor trustee. Yep, so mm -hmm. not a senior. Right. So kind of the same question. Yeah, it continues to live in the property. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> it's still it still is deferred until the state says, "Hey, you're no long, you're not a senior citizen. You know, we we either need these or it goes to sale." I'm not sure. We don't know yeah. what the trigger is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the Deschutes County let the state know, like, "Hey, we know we've been paying this deferral, yeah, yeah. but now it's in a trust." For us, we look for the flag or not the flag. <laughs> okay, moving on. We have this uh, City of Bend, any unpaid assessment or charges? This was really big back in uh, early 2000s, late 99s with the water meter. Anybody here when we had the water meter fiascos? Anyway, there was a time when City of Bend properties didn't have water meters. So every new sale had to have a water meter. So the city of Ben would put a lien for that. Um, so we had to pay that through escrow. Usually if we see any city liens now, there might be SDC fees from a builder developer, something to that effect. Most uh, regular homeowners such as ourselves, we don't really see city of Ben charges. Um, I will say if this says city of Redmond, City of Redmond likes to put liens on the property for utilities, monthly utilities such as water, garbage, um, et cetera. So we have to pay those. We just let the seller know, hey, we're paying this. This is for this month, et cetera. Make sure you get refunded because um, we do have to guarantee that there's no liens for that new buyer. So interesting. Moving on, we have this Central Oregon Irrigation District. Now, just because your title report says it has this exception, it doesn't mean that they have irrigation. It just means they're in the district. 
So, um, and there might be two districts. They might be in Swally and COI. You've seen that a few times. Yes. Uh, we have to check both. And then COI will let us know, hey, this is paid through Swally, this is paid through Avion, this is paid through, um, yes. I will say, um, just a side note, because I'm an escrow officer, we prorate irrigation dues based on season of use, which is six months. We don't base them on a, uh, we base them on a 360 day per diem, 365 day per diem, but we base them on, a, we do six months um, of the prorate because that's when the water's running. Okay, now normally this just states that there's um, HOA dues from Rosengarth Estates. Normally you wouldn't see HOAs on something that has irrigation, but remember this is a title report I don't want any of you to have, so I wanted to throw just about everything on here. This just means that I'm gonna order HOA dues um, to make sure that there's a demand, if there's anything owing, any transfer fee. All right, next page, page three. Oh, that was fast. I didn't even see it move. It worked that was good. Good job. So we have this number five deed of trust. If you notice, the grantor is not our seller. It's a huge red flag. What this means, a couple of things. It doesn't, we can fix this, but this is a red flag. This is something to be aware of. This means that the owner, Joanne, has a deed of trust on her property that isn't hers. We, we, need to, we need to fix that. We need to get to the bottom of this. This is probably one of two things. Joanne bought the property, and these were the prior owners, and this loan was paid off but not reconveyed. And we see that. That happens. If that's the case, we contact the other title company, or in this case, it's us. But if that was Ameritidal, First American, Western, we would contact them and ask them for a letter of indemnity. Do you want to go into letter yeah, of indemnity? Sure, this would happen a lot more frequently because reconveyances, I mean, they can take a, a while to process. It's got to go through the beneficiary, it's got to go through us, it's got to be prepared. Um, sometimes it'll sit on somebody's desk for eight months back east, uh, just waiting for a signature. So sometimes, even though the property transferred and sold, you know, eight months later, that deed of trust would still be out there not reconveyed. Um, so something that all the title companies do here, it's pretty common is we work with each other. And if we see, say that the previous sale was the whites to Joanne Doe, and it was insured by another title company in town, we would call them up and we would say, hey, on your file number, whatever, because it'll be on the deed, uh, did you pay off deed of trust 1073 on the property? The almost, book and page. Yeah, almost all the time, They'll, because they cleaned up the title, if it's the buyer, they'll say, yes, we did. We'll give you a letter of indemnity. And that letter of indemnity basically says, even though that hasn't been reconveyed, we promise you we paid it off and you can remove it from your title report. And so based on their indemnity to us, we'll remove it. And so you'll never see it. You won't, and that's something that you know we do it for them, they do it for us. And it makes life a lot easier for um, for everybody. It it, allevi it alleviates a stall in our escrow. So those, like Steve said, those can take six months. Last thing I want to do is have that hanging out for six months and delay a sale. So those letter of indemnities are really important. And where it runs out, oh, sorry. Does that mean somebody didn't do their job on, on that one sale? No, it just means that it's bogged in the system somewhere. It could be. I mean. It, if, if you see that it's been years and it still hasn't been reconveyed, then somebody dropped the ball somewhere because it should be reconveyed. But um, if I sold my house today to Libby and closed today, You're getting a lot of houses. <laughs> um, the loan on my house probably wouldn't be reconveyed for at least a few months and could go even longer than that. So it would still be on the record, even right. though Libby owns it. Um, that's where the indemnities and all that work. Where, where we run into trouble on situations like this is where it didn't go through another title company. So um, private parties did it or, or it went from parents to kids and they didn't get title insurance. Then there's nobody to call and get that letter of indemnity. Um, but you, you ever seen it where 
can't get that letter, that maybe that could be a yeah. And a lot of times, you know, you know, we always kind of joke. Well, it doesn't happen very often. It's not uh, that's usually like an uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Because well, uh, if somebody calls and says, "Hey, did you pay off X, Y, and Z?" and we look and oh no, we didn't pay off X, Y, and Z. First thing we do is go look at that and like, oh my gosh, did we miss it? You know, and that's the that's not a good feeling. So it happens, uh -huh. um, but not very often. Yeah, good question. Another option that this could be, like I mentioned, is a lot line adjustment. And in all of my signings with buyers, I let them know, and it, per their deed of trust, do not sell a portion of the property or the property on contract without your lender's okay before you do so. Uh, so what can happen if they don't go through title to do a lot line adjustment? This could be the neighbor's property. Joanne could have deeded a small portion of her property for a fence line, and then the Whites deed a small portion of their property to Joanne to compensate for that, and nobody got the reconveyance for that sliver, that small portion along the fence line. So that deed of trust will in full show up on her property. So it's really important if you have buyers and sellers thinking about lot line adjustments, it really should go into escrow you know, maybe not if both properties are owned free and clear, but that is one of the, that is a huge issue to have to deal with to get. Um, I've even seen people have to refinance because the lenders don't like to reconvey three feet along a fence line for 25 feet. They, they just don't understand what that's about. Yeah, so that will almost always delay closing. Yeah. I mean, by months sometimes. Right. You've got to get, say, Wells Fargo's got one loan. Chase has the other loan. You got to get to somebody at Wells Fargo who can look at it and say, "Oh, okay, let me do a partial release on that property." And you got to get somebody at Chase who will agree to do a partial release on that one. So, and they might require an appraisal, uh, which you know the the whites are like, "Why do I need an appraisal? I'm not selling my property." So it's it. I, I just like to warn every buyer when I'm signing them to do not do a lot line adjustment without talking to us. So if you do have a customer who is thinking about a lot line adjustment, that's where Steve talked earlier, bring them in, have them talk to us. Maybe we don't have a title report yet. We could just um, do a PAR report to show what's necessary, get the maps out, look at that. We'll definitely work with people on that and try to save them as much money and as many headaches as possible. Yeah, because the first thing we're gonna say is, Wells Fargo has a loan on your property. You need to talk to Wells Fargo or this property that you're going to be adding. Uh, Chase has a loan, and you're going to need to talk to Chase. You know because get them. You know, then you can do your deed. So the next thing we have is we have Joanne's deed of trust. One thing I want to bring up here: notice that that original amount is six hundred thirty thousand. That's more than our sales price. So we haven't seen those for a while. It's still really good to make note is that original amount more than our sales price. Doesn't This is not a payoff amount, don't get me wrong, so we don't know what that is, but it's just something to be mindful to talk with the other agent, to talk with escrow, um, to talk with your seller about, hey, this you have, th maybe, she, maybe she put a bunch down, she got divorced, she put a bunch down on her loan, and so it's not that amount anymore, et cetera. So just something to be mindful of. Told me you owed 500 grand on this. You know, if this was a new loan in 2022 and it's 630, I mean, that might be a flag that that net sheet could be way off. Um, sometimes you'll see underneath here includes other property. We see that a lot with builders and developers. They get a big loan for the subdivision, and then you'll go at like 2.7 million, and they're selling a house for 530,000. It will say includes other property, so that just to know that there will be a lot payoff for that, that we're not going to be paying off that total loan amount for 2.75 on a $530,000 sale. The next item, pending action, dissolution of marriage. So Joanne and Jacob uh, got divorced, um, and it's not pending. Oh, it is pending. They're getting divorced. Um, so what this means is we have to take a look at that divorce decree. 
We have to make sure there's not an equalization judgment. We have to make sure, um, is there anything else in that judgment that we need to take care of? Um, child support, make sure uh, back and forth money between the petitioner and the respondent. Sometimes this will require Jacob to come in and sign a document. Um, sometimes exes do not like to give us contact information. Um, oh, he's, he's, he's not a nice person, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, usually we're a neutral third party. Usually exes work really well with us. So um, let us, sometimes it's better coming from us. So let escrow kind of take on that burden for your seller or your buyer. Real quick, too. And, sure. You know, with this one being, you know, a pending action for divorce, you know, that really kind of bottles us up until, you know, if the decree hasn't come yet and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, really nothing can happen on the property until either the judge or the two parties agree on, you know, yes, I agree to sell it for 600. Yes, I agree to sell it for 600. And we both agree that this is what happens. If not, we're pretty much stuck. Is that fair to say? Stuck. So sometimes we can deal with attorneys. We could have um, attorney, one of the attorneys or both the attorneys hold the funds in a client's trust account. We are not ever going to hold seller's proceeds for a, um, for, on a sale uh, for a divorce. Just to let you know, that's too much liability for escrow, but that's, what, that's why people pay attorneys to get divorced. So um, just to let you be aware of that. Next item is this judgment uh, for child support. So it looks like Joanne pays Jacob $1,700 a month for child support. Now, we're going to look in that divorce decree. Sometimes it will say and sometimes it won't. But sometimes it will say that she pays the state and sometimes it will say that she pays him directly. Sometimes it will say to be determined. So if she pays the state, we can order that payoff for child support and see that there's nothing owing or there's arrearages. Um, if she pays... Jacob directly, we have to get in touch with Jacob and he needs to sign a document that requires a notary. So just to let you be aware, if you see child support, somewhat of a red flag, if they're in another state, he can sign in another state, we can send a mobile notary out there, but he will have to sign and have a document notarized. Yes. I'm, I didn't hear the first part of your question. I'm sorry. How did, how oh. Does, how does the we, we search the names. We search the names on OGEN, Oregon Judgment Information okay. Network. So we search the names. Oh, and we. Totally well, that is a very good point. So when a judgment, when a person with a judgment comes into title, and let's just say Joanne deeded it to her daughter so she didn't have to pay child support on her youngest son, that judgment remains on the property. So you can't get out of paying, not paying a judgment just because you deed off the property. So once that judgment is on the property, it stays on the property till it's satisfied. Does, did that answer your question? Yes. We have to. Yes. Well, yeah, we have to because so uh, if I have a judgment against me, any property that I own in the state of Oregon, and um, you're just rolling here, Libby. Let's say Libby's a creditor, <laughs> Libby's a creditor and I, owe, I have a judgment against me that I owe her $100,000. Even if I try it, like, you know what, I'm going to get out of bed, I'm just going to duck this, I'm going to move to Astoria, I'm going to buy a place there. They're going to see, oh, he's got a judgment. And, and it's attached to the property. And it, any, any property that I own, I have a yeah. judgment against me, it's going to attach. So it doesn't matter if I have one property or I have 30 properties, it attaches to all of them. I buy another one, it attaches right to that one as well. And if you're representing a buyer, you want us to check that because otherwise your buyer is going to buy this property. And if we didn't check that on the seller, your buyer is going to have a, a judgment from a previous owner on their property. Yes. Oh. It's interesting. What? Just for one thing, what if they left and bought over the 
that wow brilliant no sometimes um if you have a really good attorney or people know what they're doing they'll transcribe a judgment from one state to another and if that happens if they transcribe it from the state of california or the state of idaho or massachusetts they'll transcribe it to oregon because they know that person's moving there um, especially if it's child support because most people know where the parent of their child is going to live we will find that that will show up in our Oregon judgment search. Now we don't search surrounding states by any means, but they that state can put it on um, our Oregon network. But that's a good point. It's got to be transcribed, or we'll never see it. Right. So you've got to have a good attorney that makes and basically a way of saying, "Hey, by the way, there's this judgment for this person, and even though now they're out of the area." Uh, there's this judgment from this other area that affects this person, and now we'll find it. And it'll, so, it'll, as Steve brought up before, if you have a seller or you have a buyer who's like, "Oh, you know, I I got through a messy divorce. I think everything's fine, but I want to buy this property or I want to sell this property," call us. We can look that up and see if there is a judgment out there so that you know how to move forward with your customer. Going back to the spouses, real quick. Yes. Maybe one other. Um, Thing, I guess I throw the question back to you, Lizzie. Are those spouses always super excited and eager to help you and sign that document? You know, they're not, and they're not always. Um, but a lot of times, you can. That's where attorneys help us. We, I can call the um, the petitioner's attorney and say, "I'm not getting anywhere with this," and you have the attorneys fight that those battles for you. Um, yeah, it's it's not always nice. It's not always fun and games, but you know we're professionals, and and sometimes the divorce decree will say you have to do this. So then they'll be in contempt, and you know it's you know I'm not going to throw that out there. Don't get me wrong. That's for other people who get paid a lot more than I do get throw get to throw that out there. Well, we've seen it delay closing. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah. People can be mean. Um, okay, so number nine, interesting, lack of recorded easement providing access to the lands here and described from any public road. Uh, d giggles, yes. So um, do, depending on who your underwriter is, this is gonna look a little different. This means that we don't show legal access to the property. There may be access to the property. There might be a road, there might be a driveway, um, might even be paved. We don't show any recorded access to this property and I will say a lender is gonna require that this exception be removed. They will require that they have access to the property for foreclosure purposes. Like when a lender puts on a, a new deed of trust, like this one that US Bank put on, one of their stipulations is, is that they can go on to the property legally so they can foreclose on the property if Joanne stops making the payment. Another yep. way of reading that exception is saying, you have to trespass to get to this property, basically. Like you do not have legal, like, there's no public roads. Right. I, mean, I, I shouldn't say, that's a little strong, because you could be abutting. Right, Jason. Or plan or public plan or like that. Um, but there is not a public road that you legally have access to get to. Could be an easement across somebody's property and things like that. But um, when we see it in South County fairly frequently, Think of like Milliken a lot. Like there's a reason that those properties are priced where they're at. Um, because they don't have um, uh, legal access. A um, couple of things that come up. There's a, I think you asked me this question the other day. Is, uh, I never been asked this question, but it's really good. Is somebody asked like, what if you're in a subdivision, but the roads are private? So broken top. To the road. The old mill, those are private roads um, where we're at, Upper Terrace and Wilson, our part of Wilson. And um, it's all part of Upper Terrace Bayview or something like that. Um, so we don't really abut a public road or kind of thing like that. But the way they do that is when the plan is recorded and the roads are private, they they grant to the public to write, the right to use those roads now and forever. And that basically, from those private roads, you can get to a public road. So it's almost like an easement, but it gives you the access, the access to the easement. And sometimes we run into where 
There's the driveway, it's always been there. This is where we come into the property. Um, but they really don't even have an easement or anything. They're just, you know, just always driven across the property to the south. Um, but if they abut a road, say on the back of their property, we're still gonna give them access because they still abut a public road. We just don't know, and the way that they get there might not be legal, but they do have access to a public road. So we see that a few times too. If you're dealing with a big parcel and the homeowner is separating that, doing a minor partition or um, a lot line adjustment, something like that, they can. They sometimes will forget to reserve an easement because you can't grant an easement from yourself to yourself. I don't know who made that rule. So what you do is you reserve a right to have an easement. Sometimes that gets forgotten depending on um, the surveyor, or sometimes it just get, goes, you know, gets you know missed. So. Um, kids might think that they have access to the property. It's like, my parents have owned this property for like 100 years. It's like, well, you, now you have to create access. Um, so we'll see that on farmland sometimes. Also note that if somebody lives off of a forest service road, that is not considered legal access because that forest service road can be shut down by the US government for fires, for whatever. And then therefore that um, lender could not foreclose. Yes. Yeah, it's a big loophole. You've got to go down to the courthouse. You basically got to, you've got to, and there's like six or seven things that you have to show uh, to, that has been used. Um, really want to, when you get along with the neighbor, get that, uh, yeah. get that easement done. So it is possible, but again, you're also at the mercy of the court. The court could say, no. Uh, the other thing to that is when those buyers buy that property, this exception, if that's not there, they have access to that property. If this was missed by a title company, that would not be us. Um, then that title company has to provide some way of access. Like they have to work with the seller. They have to help create an easement for ingress and egress on that. So um, that's why this, if you see anything like that on a title report, email, pick up the phone, call, come in, whatever. We, and I'll usually, and our title people are really good about this too. If we see this, we're going to do some digging first and we'll probably hopefully reach out to you first before you have time to come panic and come talk to us. That's my goal anyway. Any questions? Okay, enough about not having access because that's no fun. Transfer upon death deed. So um, we see these a little more often. This is a deed that Joanna just, um, she hasn't deeded the property, but she has said, upon my death, my daughter, Julia, will own this property. So uh, it's not, so this exception will be removed when Joanna deeds the property to the new buyers. It will just come off. We don't need anything from Julia. The one thing about this is, if you're thinking this is a good way for estate planning and stuff, Julia has to wait 18 months after her mom goes to heaven before she can sell the property, get a loan on the property, before any type of title insurance can happen on this property. 18 months is a long time. So um, transfer upon death deed isn't always the best. I'm not giving any legal advice or any estate advice, but it's not always the best um, option for people. People don't know that. Yes. You know why that is? the 18 months i think so that uh if any heirs anybody wants to challenge it you've got 18 months to come forward and say uh, challenge the transfer on death murder investigation no i'm just kidding on that uh, but um yeah i i i mo it doesn't say it should say on the deed that this will be 18 months before you can, you know, before it transfers or before Julia can do something, but it doesn't say that. Some people, I mean, it's okay, you're going to wait a year and a half. Um, I understand that, but 
the benefit of avoiding probate and all that completely outweighs sure. waiting the 18 months. Sure. In this case, like where it's one heir or one person getting it, a little, a little easier. And I saw one few months back where it was like four brothers who, like the mom was elderly. They did a transfer on death deed and it was four brothers. And sure enough, you know, one of the brothers ended up needing money, wanted to do something with it, and couldn't. We are not going to answer that question, but I think you're, you might be on the right track there. <laughs> Every circumstance is different, and we're not attorneys. We're not, definitely not state attorneys. Yeah, we, we, we see everything, yeah. So next we have, these are regular things you're going to see. We're going to see an easement for Central Oregon Irrigation District for piping, for coming onto their property, um, reservations. This one's from 1917. Isn't that fun? Uh, we have to go back to deed records. Now, some of these reservations and um, old easements that you see were put on the property when they were first platted back in 1917, back in 1952. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that what they wanted to do runs through this property, but it's on the whole property that our parcel is included in. So we have to show it. It's a it's a document of public record for this property. So. If you wanted to have something like that removed, a survey, um, sometimes even an ALTA survey, which went about five to seven thousand uh, dollars, versus a regular survey, would be required to see if that could be removed. All right, next page. Yay, we're almost to the end of the town report. Um, okay, so we have CCNRs. We have um, another uh, existence of railroads, irrigation ditches, etc. Number fifteen. This is um, an, what we call an ALTA, ALTA exception. We're going to have the seller sign a document at closing stating that nobody else can claim rights to the property um, other than them. Nobody else other than themselves can claim rights to the property. There's no outstanding construction bills on the property. There's no encroachments uh, on the property. They haven't done any lot line adjustments. Nobody's built a fence, a deck, a home, a doghouse. Uh, on this property. So we will have the seller sign that. So number 15 will be removed from the lender and the uh, buyer's owner's policy. And then we have our notes, going down to our notes. Um, we do a judgment search for our buyers. And this one came up that Janet has a judgment with Ray Klein Professional Credit Services for 42500 um, because she's getting a loan, this will need to be paid because this would go in a prior lien position than the deed of trust at Wells Fargo. If you look at the first page of that title report, Wells Fargo is her lender. So first of all, Wells Fargo is going to know because they've done a credit report. We don't run credit reports. We just do judgment searches. So um, Wells Fargo will probably have that payoff. If they don't, we'll ask Janet for her information. We'll order the payoff, and that will be added to the closing statement. Maybe she paid that from her sale and it hasn't been satisfied. So we're not, we don't cast judgment. We're like, hey, has this been paid? When was it paid? Can we get a copy of the payoff? And then we can reach out and make sure that a satisfaction will be filed. So there's a couple of different options that happen with this one. Um, but as a listing agent, this would be very interesting for me to see. Like I would pick up the phone and call the other agent and say, hey, I saw that your buyer has that. Is this valid? Is this a valid lien? And you would probably say, yes, the title company's working on it or it's included in their loan or what? So, um, and then lastly, we find the deed where Jacob deeded to Joanna. Now, depending on what's on that deed, um, when that happens through a divorce, which is probably how this happened, is they will say for dissolution of marriage, for uh, equal, uh, dissolution of marriage and fulfillment of equalization judgment. So the more that we can put that into consideration, the easier it will be for future title people looking um, on this property and looking for their names. So we're just disclosing this because it is, again, a document of public record that belongs to this property. I was going to go back real quick oh. just to the name. That's fine. Uh, not that, but it just came up when I got married the day before. Um, when, and the name James Smith made me think of it. Uh, but when we 
look at common names like that, um, it, it, it gets really tough for us because you can look and you'll find dozens and dozens. I almost guarantee you a name like that is going to have dozens of judgments. And, um, and the realtors on this one, they've done it because they gave us the full middle name, James Ro Roberto Smith. Um, we had the middle name, but it still kept a dozen or two judgments on there. And, the, and, and they were asking good questions like, you know, giving you the full name, how can we you know, figure out which ones are his? A lot of them won't have even a middle initial on it. It'll just be James Smith. Um, I can remember in, I used to work in Vancouver, Washington, and there was a judgment, and I want to say it was like 20 something thousand dollars, but it was against B period Moore. And I mean, every David Moore, Don Moore, I mean, how do you eliminate that? Um, when that does happen, we have to start kind of poking and asking more questions. A frequent one is to get where they've lived the last 10 years. Because a lot of times there will be an address for the person on the judgment. So if we can see that, oh, they lived in Alaska up until two years ago, and this is a five-year-old judgment, okay, we can get rid of it that way. But sometimes we have to poke around and ask more questions, um, which is kind of uncomfortable. They never like it. Um, but we have to do it so we can get rid of the judgment. Uh, right. Judgment. Hey, we're trying to clear this judgment, make sure that it's not you. We need some additional information. We have what we call a statement of identity form. And so we'll send that out. Um, and, and that can be a DocuSign document too. So it doesn't have to be notarized or anything like that. Uh, then lastly, we have the legal description. Sometimes your legal descriptions will be on the first page. Sometimes if they're a little lengthy, there'll be an exhibit A. So um, this one, we just, put, we just put at the very end as an exhibit A. I thought this was in a sub no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Any any comments on our title report? When you guys do these, you kind of mentioned at the beginning that the creeps is something that we're not familiar with to sell or you know, yeah. recommend that our clients call. Yeah. Is it something that the title officers look at and go, hey, this is out of the norm? Like some of these things that we're talking about, are they proactive at all at calling the agent and or the client? To kind of say, hey, there's a couple things I need, I want to answer that. The, the clients themselves know we would go straight to you guys. We would say, this is what the title department is supposed to do is you know, pick up the phone to Dan, hey, um, just about done with the Smith report. Um, in a lot of work. Yes, you know, just want to know there's a couple judgments I can't get rid of. There's a bankruptcy. There's, yeah, there's something to that effect. And that's a whole nother class. So we didn't add that to the title report. But we want to be proactive to get going on those so this stuff doesn't creep up right at the end. Even back to the first page, um, you know, we don't want to find out four days before closing that, oh, you got the buyer's name. It's actually Adamson, not Adam, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the title officer reviews them. They send them to us and to you at the same time. We look them over. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. Otherwise, you are just inviting bad karma uh, to your escrow desk um, because we we want to see we we have to clear all those. And I don't like to be behind the gun on any of that. I like to have everything all ready, set to go to make that contract date. Yeah. Okay. And it's in probate. I've never shown anything, a house like that. Okay. I don't know what to expect. Um, just know that we can buy the house still, but my buyers are safe, right? Even though yeah. the house is in probate. Uh -huh. There, um, depending on what type of probate, there might be, uh, it might be a small estate, which has a four month waiting period, depending on whether they send the proceeds to the um, seller's uh, attorney to hold for heirs and devices, additional heirs and devices, or additional um, liens um, from uh, hospital liens or something like that. So that's why they hold funds on that. 
but um, your your title person, you know, if they want to make an offer, your title person will sh will show that it will disclose something to that for you. At least go look at the place. See if you like the place. Yeah. I think a fair question to ask, you know, the listing agent would be, what kind of timeline are we looking to get clear title? Mm -hmm. You know, because if your buyers, you know, need to buy something in the next forty-five days or something, right. and they say, okay, this isn't going to, you know, we're really not going to be able to transfer title for four months. You know, that would be something. And escrow is not going to hold funds for four months. Just so you know that. I just full disclosure. We're not going to hold funds for four months on a small estate. I haven't even asked your permission to do that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We are going to put this on our website so that if you, I don't think you.